Logic Pro X. Welcome everybody. It's a uh, 1016 on your radio dial. Welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and uh, fire up some brand new samples into the brand new sampler and quick say designer and um, delay designer. Those will be fun. Uh, first thing I'm going to do actually is I am going to try to uh, create a new software instrument. Sorry, I touched something wrong there. And with that, of course, comes up the library, but we know we're not going to be using the library because we're not going to use one that Logic built. We're going to use one that we're building. And traditionally, what we would have done at this point is now started the EXS24. But again, EXS24 has been updated to something called the sampler. So we're going to go ahead and go into our instruments in our channel strip. So software instrument plugin. And in this case, you'll see there is no EXS24 any longer. We're going to go into sample and we'll just use stereo because we're working with a stereo track at this point. All right. Right now, there's no sample loaded up. Actually, now that I did that, let me disconnect my hard drive and reconnect my MIDI controller, which yesterday was weird. After I connected it during the project being open, things didn't end up. And there we go. We actually got it right away. A little sine wave there. Um, so let's load in some sounds. And, and that's where you know, the EXS24 was good in a way that we were able to kind of fully see, put things in zones, map it out. So this is the brand new layout for the sampler, all right? And it kind of combines all the elements that we had back in the EXS24 to a much more easy viewing layout, right? And if you recall, and I don't know if I can get back to a, a version of Logic that has the EXS24, but it was all these very small controls, very small buttons and dials, all compacted into one window. So the first thing that they did was they actually created sections, which is always good, and clearly labeled them. So here's our synth, which is this uh, tab here. That's the top part. So we can go ahead and pitch things and fine tune things. We could turn on and off filters. So, uh, you know, a low, low end roll off or a low pass filter. Um, high, we can change the cutoff frequency, the resonation, the drive, the bite that goes into it. Um, and then we can also blend it, how we're going to do it. We're going to do it side by side, or are we going to do it in line? So in line would mean dry to wet. This would be a, basically a dry and wet, a combination of the two. So that, and that, by the way, about these filters, right? So if I'm doing them side by side, um, then they would both happen. At the same time, you'd get both sounds in the mix. If I did it one after the other, it would go through filter one first. That signal would then go through filter two, and then it would come out the other end. So that's up to you how you want to mess around with this. Sometimes people like messing around with filters, which is totally understandable. You want the customization of everything you possibly could get um, at your fingertips. But some people also like the traditional you know, linear filter one, filter two, back-to-back -back, uh, sound. Then you have your amplifier, which again, you could change panning here, which is kind of nice if you really were looking to do some panning information. And then of course, uh, your gain compensation at this point, if you change things that turned up or turned down, then you could go ahead and compensate over here. There's actually even more details underneath that. And again, they did a good job on organization here in the sampler by not showing you everything all at once. Because it, again, for some people that don't know much about this just yet, uh, it could get extremely busy and a lot of people then just shut down and go, I don't know what this does. They don't bother to take the time to mess around with it, to figure out what can happen and what cannot. So this is some of the even more detailed information of things you can do. Um, so you can glide and pitch bend. And I have a pitch bend um, uh, thing on my MIDI controller. So I get to control uh, how I'm bending up, how many cents I'm going to bend up during my pitch bend. I can go 12, which is a very big bend, or two, which is a very small bend. Uh, pitch bend down right now is going to be linked to my MIDI controller, course, tune, remote. Well, uh, we're not going to do anything with that for now because we don't have anything remoted. Uh, transpose means, again, changing things. You have to transpose the signal it could either mean you're uh, pitching you could mod you could do a bunch of different things sample selecting random velocity randoming uh amp velocity curve which how fast it returns back to a certain velocity um 
ignoring releases, uh, amp scale. So again, all of these have their own details of, and parameters that you can change. And then in the end, to be honest with you, you can automate, but that's getting a little too far for ourselves right now. And that's just synth. Let's take a look at the mod matrix. So here are your mods, your controllable mods that you can use with your MIDI controller. You can change the envelope or LFOs, uh, filter cutoff and pitching, change things by sense using the mod wheel, right? And you have options here where you can side chain into other things, change an envelope, look at all these other things, after touch, pitch bending, release, or you can have an assignable controller. So if you had a MIDI controller that had a lot more buttons and dials and wheels, this is the place where you can assign those things. Uh, so that would be in your mod matrix. And then down below is your actual uh, modulators. So right now my envelope uh, has to do with creating some sort of shape that's gonna change the way the signal plays out. And if one of these presets doesn't do it for you, then you can actually physically change it by again, what looks like automation, creating curves and bends, changing the way that envelope works. Envelope two, same thing. Envelope two is my filter one cutoff. So then again, I can change the um, decay or sustain of that cutoff. Any parameter is possible here. And then in my LFO, which is my right here, my on off switches for those I could turn it off. This is going to change your rate of wobble, you know, that, that cycling sound. Um, and you don't have to do triangle. You can make it square and sawtooth. Again, the reasons why we learn about simple waves is because these things do come up at this time uh, to understand the shape and what they would sound like. Square waves usually give it a little bite. Uh, randomness is square waves at different uh, heights and different a random smooth. Ooh, I like that, actually. That's going to be kind of cool, the sound. You can hear it bend a little bit there. It's kind of shaking, almost ringing out. So that's cool. And then we can actually go into saw, which is very, very difficult. A lot of ringing out going on here. So these are all changing the ways in which that sample that you have built into this is going to be heard. Again, synth, mod matrix, and modulators are usually what you see first and foremost. And again, there are details. There's other, you can add another envelope, a third one, you can add another LFO down here. So uh, very cool ways of, you know, going through this in piece by piece, uh, changing the way things work, you know, and again, it's almost like little plugins along the way. You have your envelope, you have your LFO, you can add another LFO, right? Different ways of looking at things. So what else is here that kind of resemble, and all, by the, all that stuff that we're seeing there is exactly the way the EXS24 used to operate. It just was a very convoluted visual element that was very difficult to control. Now it's kind of simplistic, clean, everything is visual, and you can see what you're doing piece by piece but we're still missing that mapping and zoning part. So let's take a look at those. We're gonna go ahead and click on mapping. And in mapping, we actually are given another, you know, it's still here, by the way, right? It's still in this window. All we have to do is scroll up and down. So they're now containing everything in one single wing window. That was a complaint for years about the EXS24 that you had to hit that edit button in order to go in and map and zone now they include it as almost like another plugin in a suite. So here uh, we have the ability now to drag in audio elements and then zone them up. So let's go get those audio elements that we grabbed before. Um, we can start with uh, the kick, which is a very simple one. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and just drag it right in. Now it's zoned up, so it's somewhere around here. Uh, I got octave down here. So it's between um, F sharp and A. So F sharp, G, G sharp, and A. And all four of those notes will trigger that signal. Now, how do I rezone this? How do I get this to be either more specific to a very specific uh, note? This is how you would do that. Um, you could play it like it was a audio clip, right? You can trim it down. So it's a single note length. 
and then I'm going to drag it up. So it is a standard note. So now it is, and that's it. It's just sitting on my, um, my B, which is right here. So my B now controls, whoops, there we go. My B now controls the kick. So if I wanted the hi-hat or the clap now to come in, I'd drag that guy on there, right? And I would, again, trim that down to a single note length, and I'd make that my C. So now I have the ability, and I'll make these full here. So there's my two samples loaded in. Again, it seems a little easier to work with than it did when we used the EXS24. They made it more malleable. They made it so you can really get in there and just click and drag and create. Um, great job in design elements here for Logic. They did a really awesome, awesome job. Now, I don't mind seeing the piano layout here. There is the ability to zoom in, so you really get a good sense of, uh, the notes, you can really drag them onto where you want them to be. If you're having trouble with the zoomed out version like that, you know, obviously if you're only using maybe four or five different samples, you can zoom in all the way and that way you have control over this small area. Um, but if you're using, you know, 10 to 20 different samples, you might want to zoom out so you can lay it all out. These are your views. So right now you're going to see you have your keyboard. Then we have our grouping. So this is more of the traditional look that EXS24 had. If you recall, all that information was here. We do have some information about key range, velocity ranges, and triggers. Um, and of course, my mixer information, which I don't have to change right now. That's all can be done in post-production. The other thing we have is our zones. Our zone view allows us to kind of look at things like, uh, and this is, again, more like the EXS24 layout in one shot. Uh, you have your key range, again, velocity range and mixer. And then on this side, you also now have um, your pitch, your one shot, and your reverse. So if I wanted to reverse this, that's, that's a reverse version of the this snare. This is the reverse version of the kick, right? And so we can map it out and lay it out. Again, take them off, and they're back to being... Um, and since we don't have more than one key in the zone, in the map, the pitch really doesn't matter at this point. I mean, you could take it off, but it's only one note. Now, if I had it pitched and I had it on multiple notes, it would pitch as I go up and down. The other thing, if you recall, one shot plays the entire sample through every time you hit the MIDI controller. So in this case, it kind of stops the other one and plays the new one. In this case, when I put one shot on, you can hear that there's a little overlap in between each of those samples. Now, the clap is very short, so let's see what it really does sound like with the kick. Almost sounds like a, a gunshot if you wanted to use it as a sound effect. But yes, uh, it overlaps a little more. So if I had one shot off, the old sample playback would stop the minute I hit a new note. So it sounds a little choppier. So if you want things to ring out for longer, yeah, then go ahead and put on one shot. And this is all stuff we reviewed already. Also in this, uh, group assignments, we have loop modes, which is interesting. We could actually do uh, reverse. And we'll turn it on. So that one's cool. That's a new feature. So if I turn this on, and I push it, as soon as I hit the sample, it plays the sample all the way through. When the sample is done, it then goes into a loop mode and keeps playing the reverse version of it. Let me show you, a, let me let you hear a closer version of it. I'm only gonna hit the note once. Here it is. Pretty cool. And it'll keep going and going and going. There's also a play to end of release. And so when I let go, the reverse stops, so you have to hold it down to hear the full reverse, which is kind of cool because then you have a little more control over when that note releases or when that sound stops. 
So this is in the zone view. Again, the group view, very similar. Lots of uh, controls. And then we know about the mapping here, which allows us to see where those samples reside on the keyboard. All right, so that's mapping. Let's add another area called zone. So now zone is a little different. Zone is something that I really didn't have before in the EXS24. Zone actually gives me the waveform. So when I push the node here, I get to see the whole sample. If I want to change any bit of that, like cut down, or if I want to get it closer into this part, get rid of some of that dirty bite in the back end. I actually have trimming capability right here in the sampler. So it's not the full version, but what I would use this for is I would actually go in and give it a nice, perfect start. The other thing you could do is a fade up. So it's not like this sudden punch actually gives you a little more leeway. So then if I was using that, I'd actually probably pull it back. So the fade up happens during the blank spots. So at full volume, I'm starting the sample. So that's kind of cool. This is kind of new to the sampling process. And I would actually use this to do a lot of, you know, fine tune trimming of my samples to get them perfect and just right. Also, you can make variations of your samples. So if you had another kick and you wanted that kick to be a little less, you know, have a little less bite, then maybe I would trim it in, add that fade. And now it's just like almost a downbeat of the kick at that point. Kind of feels like the air got sucked out. So again, awesome little window here that allows us a lot of flexibility. Also, we have the ability here to do that one shot element. So no matter how many times I push play, it's still gonna play it from the start. And then I also have the reverse version, which is kind of cool. You get to see it in reverse. So again, if I did like a long fade, so I don't hear that whole swell, it's a very quick swell, as opposed to this one, which was a very long swell. Or if I just wanna get this little bit of the reverse, starting right here, not this whole tail. So yeah, awesome ways to really give you fine-tuned control over sampling. Uh, an amazing change that happened to Logic um, in 10.5, especially for the home studio person. And like I said, that's kind of what their focus was on is they want more home studio people to be using Logic. And to do that, we needed to have a much better sampler. There was, there was nothing great about the XS24 other than it was free. And it had unlimited amounts of samples you could load in. If you recall, in Pro Tools uh, 12, there was only the ability with Structure Free plugin and four empty sample spots to do sampling. So after you've used four samples, now you had to have a whole nother plugin, a whole nother aux, a whole nother routing system. Yuck. So Logic always had the ability to do unlimited samples or really unlimited but only limited by the number of controller buttons you have. Now they've really stepped the game up. This is huge for the industry. People are going to start losing their minds. You're going to see producers using this a lot more. Now there's another little area down here in the sampler that we didn't really take a look at. Um, it's just overall sampler controller information. So MIDI mono mode. Um, so this is interesting. So most of your MIDI, even though I'm in stereo and I'm working with stereo samples, most of your MIDI is going to come from a single note played through. And usually that single note is triggering a single signal. And that single signal would be kind of a mono signal. But we don't have to necessarily have that. Right now, I would say I would reserve this for a much higher level MIDI user at this point. Um, so... Right now, because we don't have multiple and multiple MIDI controllers or 16 in and outs or samples that require uh, different ways of uh, attaching maybe uh, different signaling, we're going to kind of skip this for a moment, but be aware that you can even go further. This is further than the EXS20 did. Sorry, EXS24 did. Um, 
in that we can now start to go uh, multiple mono mode. Also, pitch ranges in this can be varied as well. So, so again, something to think about as you start taking classes maybe in college uh, about MIDI or digital music uh, production. And you're going to get into some higher level MIDI uh, setups, you know, with controllers and buttons and automation and things like that. So my recommendation is to get the core information down. Like I said, understand how this works, knowing that you can do certain things with the sampler. And then as you finally, you know, get that, information as uh, your foundation, then you can start building upon it with new setups. And I'm telling you right now, there are some MIDI controller setups that are absolutely amazing and they're very confusing. And unless you know just the basic core of how MIDI works, something like playing with the mono mode or, or pitching ranges aren't going to make much difference to you as well as things like, you know, mods and, I'm messing around with the sustain here. So there are certain controllers that can actually even take that MIDI performance to the next level. And we already kind of looked at that in Logic, by the way. And I don't know if you guys remember, but when we were able to look at, uh, and I'll record something really quick. Okay, just something. When we were able to go into our editor down here, do recall that we were also able to see the velocity information in terms of the note velocity and how hard I hit it. So you could see that I can increase and decrease note velocity here and make it louder and make it softer, right? So I can make it much louder and you can see it changes the color. This is all things that we did already. So there is a way that we could automate this as well um, and change the way things work. Uh, also, we have track velocity and volume. Uh, and this is for every single MIDI performance that we do down here in the editor. The other thing, um, and, oh, that's nice too. I don't remember that being an option, but pretty cool. Um, I don't know why my sample didn't play out before. Now is it gonna play? Let's see. Yeah, it's not it's not triggering my other sample, which is obviously there, but it's fine. Move that up a little bit. See here. Um, but this is where the buttons of a MIDI controller can start being uh, utilized for higher level MIDI functions, and so all that becomes part of this as well as in automation being able to go in and changing things like course tune and fine tuning and output panning, envelope information, tact case sustain release. And you can use dials on your MIDI controller to become the controller itself for these parameters. So again, higher level MIDI uh, functionality is going to be something that's in your future. So to just gain the information about simple MIDI um, processes and recording and, and changing will definitely help you when you start getting into that next level of MIDI sampling. Uh, let's check out now the quick sampler. So we saw the sampler and what its capability is. Let's jump over to the quick sampler, which is only two right there above it. And we'll go into stereo setup. And you'll see, as we mentioned before, that the XS24 had this really convoluted, very confusing looking surface. Then we looked at the newer version of the XS24 with the sampler. Now we have the quick sampler. So this is a little different because it incorporates pretty much everything we just did into one single window. So let's go grab a sample. Uh, we'll grab our kick as we had it before. We'll drag it right into this space. Again, it looks just like it before. I said you could trim it down. This was in the zone part. You can add your fades. That's all here in the quick sampler. Same thing on this side. All right, you can actually um, turn on one shot right here. So your classic sampler. Your one shot. 
and see how it's pitched right now. And I can turn that off. Every key is the same note. Although, as I'm getting up higher, it actually is starting to, because I'm in one shot, they're starting to react to each other. And we're starting to lose some signal because there are a couple that are in phase. So these two notes are happening at the same exact time, or even if they're off by a little bit, they'll start canceling each other out at certain areas. So that right there is a sign that we are getting some phase issues. So we have to be careful on our one shots that we don't hit the keys too close together. Otherwise, they will start interacting and sounding like they're going out of phase. Um, slicing mode, we did a little bit of that yesterday, right? We were able to take parts of the sample and make it their own notes. So I forget where I start on this. I think it's down on C. I don't know where it's, where's C? Oh boy. Uh, I can look here at start key is C1, which is where I'm at. Interesting. There it is. Um, So now that I sliced it, C is actually the first part. C sharp starts at this next marker right here. And then D1 is that very end sample. Now this doesn't help when we have a very, very small sample. It helped yesterday when I said a few things in a row. So let's get this, um, let's get this sample out of here. And we'll just do it the easy way. And that's get rid of the sampler, put the sample back in. So now that we have this in here, um, I can actually, as we showed you yesterday, we do have the ability to, nope, we do have the ability to record directly into this sampler, which is pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, so we're going to go ahead and stop that. I keep clicking on it. We're going to go into uh, the recording option. So that's right here in recorder. And so we're going to do a couple of things like we did yesterday. We're going to throw a couple of samples in there, but I'm going to beatbox a little bit. All right. So let's see if we can get parts of my beatbox into the sample. Mm -hmm. No recording input. Oh, my input. I have to change. Right. Input. Input. One. Yo, yo. So that last sample is going to be really long. Let's slice it up. Let's see what we got here. Starting on C1. So I'm going to octave up. So actually, I'm going to delete this guy, make him part of the sampler at the back end. I am going to trim it up, and that way it's the whole thing. So here we go. Yeah. Right. So we have the ability now to take my whole, and that could be really pitched down if I needed to. Pretty cool, right? So all of that allows me to just take very simple parts and pieces along the way and find little areas. Like this is a cool little hi hat, closed hi hat sound. Right? Or a little shaker if you want to do So we have a lot of different ways that we can change this as well. Like I said, we had this whole layout down here for the LFOs 1 and 2. So if we want to add different changes to that, our mod matrix, same thing as in the sampler that we had before. If 
velocity, pitch bending, mod wheel aftertouch. Again, it's all condensed now because this is considered to be the quick sampler, not the full detailed sampler. Um, this allows us then to go in here and change pitch. We can actually, again, add that filter where we can add resolution, uh, resin, whatever it is, and then do our filter cutoff. And then we can add some envelope depth, depth and there is some crazy stuff going on there. And drive it up, really dirty it up. So changing some of the filters. Um, going down below here, I could, same things as before. Yeah, I'm trying to scroll, it's not letting me scroll here. So I change some of that velocity here that envelopes that we're working with see and there's a, a, a cutoff here now i'm up above the frequency range there's less low end more high end here's what that sounds like so now we're getting really you know distortion level sound things that normally wouldn't be there not truly part of the original signal now we're really changing things. And then I could start wobbling it, really getting into it. Um, there is a bunch of other filter-based presets that you can use. Um, the high pass at six decibels. So that's just really some high-end frequencies, nothing great there low end um we can make it gritty and sharp and that really is kind of where we were going with that last one this is the fat one. Oh yeah much louder so yeah i mean playing around with this stuff is definitely a lot of fun um being able to go in and mix it up a little bit changing different elements so if i pitch bend it again and here i can bend that with my pitch bend button um here's that Pitch it down. So as I'm just holding my pitch bend, I'm able to, you know, create some sort of change. Uh, the mod wheel, same thing with the filters. Again, this sampler is actually really easy to use. I mean, super easy to go through and, and click on a few things. Much, much easier than the EXS24 ever was. So uh, let's go into the instruments again and. Take a look at some of the new elements here. Again, we do have Ultrabeat. It's still here. It never really left. Did it change its view? The answer is no. The Ultrabeat was not updated, but that's because the new Ultrabeat is technically the drum machine designer, as we know. And again, we have the ability to then enter in uh, our kick and our snare into these areas. So if I wanted the kick to be there, it's there. Um, let's add in the clap onto one of these samples. Uh, dun, dun, dun. So I can't um, pitch down here. Nope. Maybe I should be pitched down. There it is. These two. This and that. So C and E. And then, of course, we can uh, resample the pad. Right. Uh, what just happened? Oh, it's missing it. Oh, okay. All right. That's fine. Oh, we can record into it. We can actually record the sample into that. Show. Let's see what we got here. Input, input, input. Show. So there it is that. I don't know why it's still not letting me play around with that. Let's see too. Show, 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 show. show. So you see they've now integrated the sampler, quick sampler, into the drum machine designer. I'll show you that again. So I basically want to create a new sample. I could either record directly into that or start a new one like I did up here. I started a new one. When I started a new one, what I was able to get is a version of the quick sampler where that recorder option was. So now I can just record into it. If I want to slice it up, I could. So... Uh, where was I? Uh, did I miss C2? 
Yeah, so now these are variations of that. We'll go back to classic here. Show, 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 show. So that's laying out on that. And then we can go ahead and program in uh, an instrument for this one if you wanted this one to be the kick. I don't know why there's a copy of that. Uh, clear that pad. Let's put it back into this one. And we will go ahead and uh, do, 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 do. why does it say resample the pad? I don't understand that. I'm going to ignore that. And you can see it says right there, right as we did that quick sampler. We go ahead into recorder again, selecting my input. Show. And there's that. Okay, I don't know why I keep saying my thing is there, but I should have my C2 sharp. Show, 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 show. So now if I wanted my kick to be here, I'll go over and grab my kick. And it's alphabetical, so I should be able to find it in two seconds. Drag that into there. Hello. Hello. Drag audio sample to the pad, which I did. Doesn't like it. Maybe because of the formatting of it. Let's see if the clap lurks there. No, definitely doesn't like that. That's interesting. Maybe it wants to be over in the library, possibly. That's somewhat new. That's an interesting one. So let's, let's do that. Let's keep it so we have our sampled thing here. And let me see if I can go around this and be able to grab desktop uh, and our kick. And let's put that in the sampler here. No, it doesn't like that either. All right, so then we'll just leave it at that for now. And you can always just load in the sample now and do it like that. And I don't know why it's in there. So our resample one's there, but then it changes it up. So we can always move it again, put it into A1, which is this sample. And then we can load in our sample uh, load audio file onto our desktop, throw in our kick, just a way around it. And then our kick should be here. Show. 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 So there we go. We're using the drum machine designer now to load in samples and direct pretty much the same way we were doing with the mapping part of the sampler. We were able to now lay it all out on a, you know, a grid base as opposed to a keyboard base. So if you had, you know, the native instruments um, machine or you had a uh, launch pad or you had the uh, rolly, you know, touch pads, those things can be programmed as MIDI controllers to then follow the outline of this. And again, now each sample has a very similar layout as it does down here where we can do playback the reversed. So that was my, wash, wash. so we can have kind of a couple of versions of that. What I would do is I'd probably trim it up a little bit. Wash, 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 wash. So yeah, I mean, again, same layout as the sampler and the quick sampler. They've now made it consistent and common throughout all of these types of uh, plugins. Uh, what else actually has reflected that? Oh, I hate that they do that. That my drum machine designer ends up becoming only drum machine designer. I want to go back into the library really quick and just see what else there is. So there's all of these other, um, you know, integrated plugin sampler instrument generators. Alchemy has been around for a very long time. Drum kit designer, as we know, was our regular drums, drum synth. And then a bunch of these synths for ensembles and uh, flutes and all those other instruments. Um, we have horns and strings from the studio. Sculpture was another one. It's a modeling synth. Let's take a look at that. They really haven't updated that. It looks very much like old school Logic stuff. And remember, this is what we were looking at before. So look at the LFO. Isn't that really difficult to understand and figure out what's going on? That's why they did the sampler. Because it has a much better way of organizing and visualizing some of the elements. Same thing with Ultra Beat. I mean, it just looked confusing. I would know what I'm looking at, but many people that would go in there and try to mess with it would have a hard time figuring out what that little tiny little dial in there would do. So when they made the sampler, they made it have this really nice look, something that we are now very familiar with 
in current updates with Logic. They've uh, cleaned it up, made it look nice and fresh, and laid it out in a way that is very easy to understand. Things that you can touch and know what you're touching. Clearly labeled, clearly shown. Um, the other one that I wanted to look at was the Studio Horns. So this is a relatively new update. This is not actually a 10.5 update. Uh, this is a, a horn specific um, sampler. And as you can see, as we were talking about yesterday, the articulation, and we talked about it Monday as well, the articulation is a relatively new concept for strings and for horns in that we have now different ways that we can change the signal, not just a, you know, push a button. Usually we were in staccato, right? Which is just, and that's it. Now we can do things like a growl, which is something very, very cool that they're changing. A little scoop, a little wow, um, expressive short. That I like. That, that's something that you would used to have to program in. And that's not easy to program because it has to do with some vibrato and attack and release and a little bit of volume control. Now it's all part of these little algorithms and they've labeled them for you. Right? Um, and uh, Mercado. Now, again, I don't appreciate the samples they're using because they're not all that great. Um, there is sections. Of course, you want to do like a jazz section. So now you have... So now you have different parts of the keyboard laid out. This goes with mapping and zoning. So they've now zoned out three or four different horns. So you can now play the, the saxophone, the trumpet, and the trombone on one small scale uh, piano. Let's octave down, I mean octave up. So, and then of course with the changes comes our ability then to do, right? So we have those new elements built into some of these samplers. Uh, the other one that of course we looked at on Monday was the strings and the same concept here that we have all these new little ways of uh, changing the way the violin plays. So pizzicato would just be. And then of course, all the way up to a, a trill. And those things are again now integrated right into the plugins. Other things that may have taken on some new shape would be our standard pianos. So a vintage electric piano. And you see, nope, it looks like they're gone with the classic view here. Nothing's tremendously changed. We still have the ability to play our electric piano sound, but the layout is still relatively old school. And I did want to check Alchemy really quick because I didn't see any big changes in the way they were doing Alchemy, but it looks like it's a relatively newer view anyway. So when we go to Alchemy, um, Alchemy has been around, but it, it already went through its change. I'm thinking back in version eight to nine. And again, when you're doing this, we can move around. And we looked at those arpeggiators, right? And we can really create some sort of crazy... dirty, right? Um, but there was one where I, we were at it yesterday and that was in our electric drum kit. And we'll go into our, um, we'll go into the after party one, All right? And so drum machine designer now gives us the layout. Uh, we have the ability to use synths and go down the octave here. Remember in a pack take folder, you have the ability to go in and 
go into each instrument individually, change things. Nothing much has changed there in Logic. That was a relatively new feature. So they haven't spent much time with that. And I think the biggest things you guys are going to see in regards to changes is going to be your delay designer, delay designer, and your reverb space designer. And so if we just look at that quick to prepare for tomorrow, you'll see it's a brand new look. Again, updated view, updated features, simplistic, not as confusing. And they give you the option to go in and only turn on or turn off the features that you want. The other way seemed a little confusing, and that's why they updated it. And we'll, we'll pick that up tomorrow. Pick that up tomorrow. Delay designer, space designer, new layouts, new fun. Anybody have any questions about anything from today about the two samplers? Cool. Everyone enjoy their day. I will see you all tomorrow, 10 a.m., bright and early. See you then.